I'm not going to uh, sing them, but John Lennon famously penned the following lyrics uh, to one of the Beatles' best-known tracks. He said, all you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. Now, I'm not totally convinced of John Lennon's theological credentials, but whether he, he meant it or not, the words he penned in this song express a deeply rooted truth. A cry that we can all echo and which reverberates uh, in our very core. You see, without wishing to sound too much like a tree-hugging, scented candle-lighting, sandal-wearing hippie, I want to suggest that Lennon was right, that all we really need is love. Love is at the heart of our faith. It holds us together and it drives us forward as Jesus followers. It is the central theme that runs throughout the Bible. We see it in the beginning, reflected in the loving, creative, Trinitarian relationship of the Father, the Son and the Spirit, breathing creation to life. And we see the culmination of the greatest love story ever told in the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus for our freedom. Remember these well-known words from John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son. Love is good. Love transforms. It heals. It gives life to. It values and it offers hope. It is right, therefore, that as we are following a series on practical ways to bring hope to those around us, that we just spend a moment to stop and to look and to reflect on love. But before we spend the next few minutes having a big group hug I want to give us a warning. You see, the Jesus way of doing things is not usually the same as our way of doing things. In fact, the Jesus way often seems to come with, with something of a cost. Um, it requires something of us. And yet it is a cost which ultimately always leads to life, full life, transformed life. And so it is with love. If you have a Bible in front of you, or a Bible app on your phone, and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. And we're going to uh, start at, at chapter 6. Let me just find it a minute. Should be better prepared. And we're going to start reading from verse 27. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who ill treat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons and daughters of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Just let the reality of what Jesus is asking us to do in this passage, as his apprentices, just let it sink in for a minute. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I can get on board with, with God loving me and, and with having to love my neighbour, at least the ones who are nice to me and, and who like the same kind of things as me. And I can also get on board with, with loving the marginalised and, and the oppressed and those that the world has seemingly forgotten. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He asks us, in fact, he tells us to love our enemies. Our enemies, who, who might they be? Well, they may be people who have deliberately hurt us or, or used us or, or robbed us of our worth and our value. 
There may be people who have persecuted or ridiculed us for our faith or maybe for other things uh, about who we are uh, and what we do. There may, however, not even be people that we know, but those who we see maybe in the media who do atrocious things or, or maybe corrupt political leaders or institutions who, who abuse their power, who don't pay their taxes and, and are morally at the opposite end of the scale from us. Jesus asks us to love these people too. In fact, the greatest commandment is to love God and now love our neighbour. And our neighbours, uh, as I've just said, are, are not only the, the nice, gentle, quiet Joneses next door. They can also be the abusive, morally questionable nightmare next door. Christian activist and writer Jim Wallace says that we shouldn't put a limit on who our neighbour is. And yet we are called to love them, whoever they are. Now, I'm going to lay my cards on the table and say that I was not a huge Donald Trump fan. In fact, I found him to be morally corrupt, bigoted and a, and a threat to anyone who wasn't like him. It used to really wind me up to see the white evangelical church lift him up as if he were Jesus himself. I didn't like him. I didn't want to pray for him. And I certainly didn't love him. And yet in the run up to the US election last year, I felt challenged again that if all are made in the image of God, and therefore even the most cracked and distorted image can contain something of God's breath and design, even if deeply hidden. And if Jesus really does ask us to love our neighbour, even when they are our enemy, then my attitude had to shift. Now I realise that this is a, a slightly trivial example and, and that feeling challenged on how I spoke about a political leader I didn't know is very different to having to forgive and love someone who has seriously wronged us or worse. But the principle, I think, is the same. Jesus says, as part of our apprenticeship to him, that we are to love our enemies. We are to bless those who curse us. We are to do good to those who have wronged us. And we are to pray for those who mistreat us. Ouch. This apprenticeship is hard. However, I want to help us reframe how we look at this command. Firstly, let's get our understanding of love right. I think we uh, so often equate love as being something that it isn't. We, we live in a Western society that increasingly depicts love as being purely about an emotional reaction or a warm, tingly feeling. Something that is, is maybe a bit soppy or, or about romance or, or, or even sexualized. And I'm not saying it's not about those things, but I think we've made it just about those things. However, the way that, that, that Hollywood and, and OK Magazine present love is very different to the way that the Bible presents it. Love is a verb. Uh, it, it is a doing word. Uh, it, it therefore requires something of us. It involves us not, not being passive, but instead using our hands and our feet and our mouth. It isn't just an attitude. It is an action. 1 John 3 gives us an overview of what this biblical love looks like. John writes, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Love is therefore not just an emotional feeling and response, but rather it is a radical transformative action. It is about sacrifice, about laying ourselves down for the sake of others, preferring others to ourselves. It gives life. It does not tear down. As one John goes on to say, it is not purely about words, but about action. In the context of what Jesus is teaching about loving our enemies, it is about how we lay down our anger and offer up forgiveness. It is about turning words that put down and speak hatred, even from a place of hurt, into words of prayer and encouragement. It is about saying, yes, I feel hurt by you, but is there anything I can do to be a blessing to you? The good news is that we are not called to like our enemies. We are not called to like our enemies. Jesus doesn't tell us to like those who hurt us or, or those who do horrendous or morally re reprehensible things. He doesn't command us to spend loads of time with them and to be their best friend. We aren't told to agree with or, or join in with those that oppress or cause pain. No, like and love are very different things. 
I didn't like Donald Trump and his policies that oppressed and marginalised people who he saw as different to him, or which incited racial hatred. But Jesus didn't ask me to like him. Instead, Jesus asked me to love him, which meant praying for him, and which meant stopping ripping his character apart on social media. Again, a trivial example, but hopefully you get my point. Jesus is calling us to act in a way towards those who are our enemies, in a way that honours God and sees a broken, distorted, cracked image bearer of God beneath the corrupt, sinful messiness. You see, a cracked and broken mirror may no longer reflect the image of the person looking into it, but it is still a mirror. The second thing I want to help us see um, is that what seems impossible to us uh, is always possible with God. What seems impossible to us is always possible with God. In Jesus, in God with skin on, we, we find impossible reconciliation. Reconciliation between humankind and God. Humankind and humankind and humankind with creation. I would never ever trivialise with some uh, people, maybe some of you listening to this have been through or are going through the incredible suffering and heartache inflicted by other people, the evil acts that have robbed families of children or, or, or children of parents. I can't even begin to imagine what laying myself down for an enemy that has done the worst of the worst would be like, or even if I could do it. But I do believe in a God who can do what we can't do. Time and time again throughout scripture, God says, I am with you and I will be with you wherever you go, in whatever you face, in however you're feeling. We'll come up to Pentecost in a couple of weeks where we remember the gift uh, of Jesus' spirit, which he left us to guide us, to comfort us, to heal us, to lead us, to transform us, to free us. It is the same spirit which hovered over the chaos at the start of time and brought order and beauty and life. And it is the same spirit that we are promised, that we are given and which surrounds us and goes before us and heals us as we step out to love our enemies. As we bravely offer impossible reconciliation to those we have been hurt by or who have, we have become estranged from. Today, if you're feeling like you want to take the brave step of loving an enemy who has hurt you, then please know you are not alone. The spirit of Jesus is with you. Hold out your hands and ask God to fill you afresh. Ask those who you trust around you to stand with you in prayer and then receive the free gift of the transformative breath of God. You see, for impossible reconciliation to happen, it is likely that we have to make the first move. Remember, love is an action and so it requires something of us. This isn't easy. But the spirit means you are never alone. And finally, loving our enemies seems like a countercultural thing to do. In many ways, it seems like a pointless thing to do. And in reality, it may not even change our situations or how we're feeling. But there is power. There is power in love. There is power in forgiveness. There is power in prayer. And there is power in being a blessing. When we choose to do these things, especially to those who have wronged us, there is a shift in our own heart. Forgiveness is a weapon which overcomes anger and bitterness and hardness of heart. It may not physically remove the pain, but it frees us from the power that that pain may have over us. Remember, love is more than words. And so it is with forgiveness. It, it may or may not change the wrongdoer, but it will certainly free us from the grip of pain and fear. Loving our enemies is not easy, but it does transform us and it does transform situations. If you're not, uh, if you're still not convinced uh, yet uh, about any of this, then, then just reflect on these words from Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man or woman, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just let that sink in. However perfect we may think we are, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, we still make mistakes. In fact, early in Romans, the Apostle Paul writes that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, everybody has, has sinned. And when we sin, when we make wrong choices, when we act outside of God's best, when we, then, we, then we begin to drive a wedge between us and God. Sin, you see, puts us at odds with God. It grieves him. In many ways, when we ignore God, we act as though we are his enemy, in that we are choosing to act in a way which causes him pain. And yet, and yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For you and for me. And why? Because God so loves the world. Because he made humankind. He looked at us and, and he said, we are very good. The pinnacle of his creation, his masterpiece made in his image. Church leader, writer and, and, and personal legend to me, Bruxy Cavey, writes this. The Romans drove nails into the hands and feet of Jesus. And yet God loved them. The religious leaders of his day hurled insults at him, and yet God loved them. The disciples denied and deserted Jesus, and yet God loved them still. We can be like those Roman soldiers, or we can be like the religious leaders at times, or we can be like the disciples, can't we? And yet Jesus still loves us. In fact, he loves us enough to lay down his life for us to forgive us over and over and over again and to reconcile us to the father not only now but for eternity my point is we are called as apprentices to imitate the one we are apprenticing well the one we are apprenticing jesus not not only teaches about loving our enemy but he loves uh, but he models it day in and day out through his unwavering devoted patient gracious and forgiving love for us, those weak and cracked image bearers who regularly get it wrong. John in his first letter says, we love because he, God, first loved us. The journey we are on is not meant to be easy because it carries a cost, but it is a cost that will always lead to life. And this is not only a hope, but also an assurance that we can hold on to. This week, how can we start to love our enemies in the way that Jesus has shown love to us? Maybe to a family member or a work colleague who has wronged us. Maybe to someone in our community who has caused trouble or damage. Maybe to someone in authority who we disagree with. Think about what love would or could look like in those situations. Maybe it's a change to the way that we use social media. To start to build people up rather than tear them down. Maybe it is to model radical hospitality and bless someone who has let us down with a cake or, or a coffee or even a meal. Maybe it is to take the first tentative step to forgiving someone who has wronged us. Or to begin the process of reconciliation with a family member or friend who we have become estranged from. Maybe it is to cancel the debt of someone who owes us something or just to give something away for free without expecting anything back or maybe it is to start to pray to pray for those who we see as enemies who have hurt us and to ask for a fresh wave of the spirit of God to bring healing freedom and boldness to step out and model the transformative love that Jesus so lavishly pours out upon us let's pray Jesus, we thank you for your love, your love which is so undeserved, your love which, which chose us before we even knew who you were. Thank you that you laid down your life for us and we pray this week for boldness to step out and begin to lay down our lives for those around us, particularly for those who we maybe see as our enemies. Give us the strength we need, we pray, and be with us, we ask. In your name, Jesus. Amen.